So welcome, my friends. So glad to have you as part of this weekly live stream class. It's co-hosted with the Insight Meditation Community of Washington. And tonight's a special night as we have a, we have a guest with us. I'm grateful to have with us, excited to join and to introduce to you Lama Rod Owens. But I also first want to thank Rhonda Jacobs and Rebecca Halseth uh, for doing the interpreting tonight for those who are with us who are deaf or hard of hearing. So blessings, dears. Thank you so much for being part of this. Okay, Lama Rod. Well, as a way of introducing, Lama Rod's a major inspiration to me. Like right now in these current times, um, he brings together a really deep inner work um, and this dedication to social change, to activism, in a way that leads to true transformation. It's that, um, that bodhisattva spirit that we most need in these times. So Lama Rod was trained in Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, he received his Master of Divinity at Harvard uh, Divinity, and co-authored a book many of you know about with Reverend Ang uh, Angel Kyoto Williams, a book, uh, it's called Radical Dharma, talking about race, love, and liberation. And then his most recent book, which I just finished, is Love and Rage, The Path of Liberation Through Anger. And I totally encourage you to get it. Uh, it was just powerful, good medicine, filled with insight and beautiful energy. So Lamarad, thank you so much for being with us. Really, blessings and welcome. Just fabulous to have you here. And I love the title and the topic that you offered, uh, Love and Fear During Times of War. So here we are during these times and maybe just to begin, uh, how are you doing? How's your heart with what's, what's going on these days? Yeah, yeah um, I'm exhausted actually. Um, I just, I, you know, I'm tired. Uh, um, and I don't think that's anything particularly new. Um, but I think the fatigue comes from the way in which I, like many of us, and probably yourself as well, Tara, where, you know, we're stepping up the practice to hold not just our particular struggle, but also the struggle of the world of so many folks around us. You know, there's deep conflict, you know, right now. Um, and it's a, when I talk about war, I'm also talking about spiritual warfare happening. I feel like there's the, the spirit is, uh, is in, it's, it's in conflict for many of us, you know, and I'm really being called really to the cushion to really like dig into love and compassion and gratitude and patience, you know, and empathy right now. Um, because I think those are, you know, how we, I don't know, how we care for ourselves and we care for the world, you know. But having said all of that, I am still doing very well. <laughs> At the same time, I'm still really grateful for practice. And that tends to the ways in which maybe sometimes I can get hopeless and experience hopelessness and fear, yeah. you know, that the world may go off the ledge into something that may not be conducive to the freedom of many of us. You know. So... Yeah, so I guess, you know, I'm wondering, because you, you wanted to explore love and fear, mm -hmm. and fear is so big right now. And is, is that a primary way that fear takes shape in you, that the world, the degree of suffering, and it can just get worse? Yes. Yeah, it's the fear. Yeah, it's the anxiety that for me comes from wading into um, this future and wondering, well, is there a place for me 
in the future? Is, is there a place for my freedom and the freedom of the communities that I belong to? You know, is there a space for us to be happy and well and restored and tended to in the ways that we need to be tended to? Um, and is that the fear you're feeling from others also? Yes. That, that sense of there might not be room for these bodies and hearts to be, yeah. have a life, really. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is um, really contributing to this kind of shutting down that many of us may be experiencing. It also tends to feed into or express itself as like deep fatigue, mm. you know, as well. You know, where many of us are saying, I have no idea what's going to happen, nor am I looking forward to what's going to happen. So I kind of shut down. And I think for me, that's also an expression of trauma. You know, that kind of numbing, shutting down, which I also call disassociation as well. I can't really deal with how my body is processing this anxiety, the fear. And so I need to take a break. I need separation right now. Um, and so I kind of exist. You know, not me, but I'm just saying that, you know, I see people existing within this kind of limbo, you know, where they're just really disconnected from how their bodies are showing up right now. I'm, I'm right with you. I think what I, I'm feeling the same, that there's such a sense of um, uncertainty about the future that it's almost like waiting, but waiting with fear for something bad. And in that tensing, we get exhausted by tensing. And we also sometimes shut it down with depression. And I'm also seeing huge loneliness, like it isolates. Yes, yes absolutely. And that disconnect is also about, not only am I afraid of a future, I'm also afraid of people, you know, because I don't know who people are. I don't know what they think. You know, I don't know what they believe, you know? And so I still, need to protect myself, you know, and that's always a reality for certain communities, you know, certain marginalized communities where like they have to be really careful about who they're with and where they go, you know, and that all just adds together, you know, just all compounds back into the fear. Yeah, but I, I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. and that trauma has to do with cutting off, and when you yeah. feel cut off, mm -hmm. you don't trust it, that you really belong to anybody. You have to kind of, the vigilance is there. So tell me a little about how you're working. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. What's your process? Because I, I mm -hmm. feel like we're all trying to find a way, yeah. find a refuge in this. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, for me, every day it's getting up and making a commitment or a recommitment to trusting my practice, mm. you know, and, and saying, you know what, my practice has held me for almost 20 years, which is like half of my life now. And I want to continue to trust my practice to take care of me. You know, and, you know, I come, you know, I come from the Tibetan tradition. I come from you know, shamanic practices and ancestral indigenous practices. So I'm really into really developing relationships with deities, particularly Tara, right? And that, and Tara for me is like a primary deity that I actually just, I am relying on as a source of refuge, right? As a reflection and an emanation of my own innate compassion you know, particularly my own innate liberatory compassion, freeing compassion. I rely on that and continually to take refuge in this deep belief and trust that my compassion actually is enough. You know, to continue to touch into the discomfort, to continue to always remember that I am not the only one mm. that's struggling in the world. You know, that even the person that I despise the most in mm. the world is also suffering mm. like me mm -hmm. you know um and if i hold that perspective then i can maintain my humanity and continue to relate to the humanity of everyone around me you know and that's that's such an important practice for me to remember that we're human and we're trying to make the best choices we know how to do 
how to make, but we're all coming into this world with different resources, you know, um, and not everyone got the resources that they needed coming into this world that helps them to feel connected and loved and a part of something. Yeah. You know, and I know there's intense deficiency that people are operating out of. And I want to show up for that. But at the same time, you know, and this is another part of my kind of, you know, um, coming out of my own um, toolbox around managing these times, which is setting boundaries, mm -hmm. too, which means that, like, yes, I can see your suffering, but I don't have to actually stick around for you to use me as a target. Mm -hmm. you know, to blame me for your suffering, <laughs> you know? Um, and so just really, I call it protecting my energy, you know? So that means that like, yeah, I'm not going certain places. I'm not in interaction with certain people. I'm not reading certain things. I'm not getting involved in certain situations. Um, I allow myself to not like people, you know? Um, because me trying to like people becomes a burden of emotional labor that I don't feel is necessary, you know, but again, compassion is what I do feel is necessary, right? Everyone deserves compassion, mm. you know, and love, but I don't have to like you. I just want you to be free from suffering, you know? So first of all, every, what you're saying is so resonant that it, that you really um, trust in the power of compassion mm -hmm. and you trust that it moves through you and you have a way to access it. You actually have very deep practice to access it. And what I wonder about so often is that you said something that really caught my attention, which is that not everybody comes in with the resources to have that kind of sense of contact or belonging. You know, Mother Teresa says, you know, our sufferings mm -hmm. because we have forgotten our belonging to each other. And some people have less ability, like you, you can use the, the goddess Tara to, mm -hmm. and you have ways of reconnecting. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how do you, I can understand you holding another with compassion when they're cut off, but how do you help people find their pathway to compassion um, when they've been traumatized and are cut off? What are the ways that you use to help them? I embody compassion for them. So I become an example, a living, live, embodied example of what it looks like to experience compassion, to express compassion, to be compassionate. And I let the practice speak for me. You know, often, you know, I think sometimes we get into this habit of always feeling like, oh, I have to like tell people, I have to explain things, I have to like give people a list, right? And, you know, but I have often found in my practice that really just showing you is a transmission that is deeply moving, you know? And for my teachers, I choose my teachers by the example that they embody, not by necessarily their teachings, you know, but how do I feel around them, you know? And if we can deeply embody compassion, then we can move into interactions with folks and folks will begin to sense, you know, maybe in a way they're not conscious of, or maybe not in a way they're able to articulate, but they begin to sense that we're not there to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And they begin to, to let down defenses. They do, you know, they begin to let down their guard, you know, and that closeness, that belonging can begin, you know, and of course the, the embodied expression comes through also how we're speaking to people, like mm -hmm. how we're holding space for ourselves, mm -hmm. how we're connecting to our own discomfort, how we're actually doing emotional labor for ourselves, you know? So when someone's really holding themselves in this compassionate energy, being with everything that arises, right? When they enter into relationship with others, there's a sense that like those folks don't have to do a lot of labor in that relationship. And so you can relax, you can open, you can take a break and say, ah, this, this is so refreshing, you know? You know, and it, 
you know, and I, there's a Shanti Deva prayer that um, I love to recite in some of my practices. And in the prayer, Shanti Deva says, you know, may I become the medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, may I become the medicine. Our practice actually helps us to become the medicine for folks in a way that we're not even trying to be medicine, but we become medicine because we're doing the practice for ourselves. So as I'm taking in what you're saying and also just the energy of that, I can sense how you create a field that's safe. And so let's say with me, I could feel, okay, so whatever ideas and defenses are here are, can uh, drop away. And then in the space that opens up, that is compassion. I mean, yes, exactly. So in mm -hmm. other words, your, your transmission will actually create the environment that another person's true nature their their heart can unfold yes you know because it's about entering through interactions and relationships where we're transmitting this this truth that i don't need anything from you like i'm not here to take anything away i'm not here to take your time to take your emotional energy or labor i'm here just taking care of myself and I'm inviting you into the space to sit with me, to have whatever we're doing. We're having a conversation. We're having some tea, you know, whatever we're doing. It's just like, let's just be together. You know, I don't want you to work around me or to work to have me, you know, in the space with you. I just want you to, to open, you know, and, and that opening is the restoration, you know, and the compassion itself. And, you know, and I, I, I feel as if, you know, sometimes I think many of us who are joining in to the discussion, um, I think right now people want to do something. You know, people want, okay, what can I do? <laughs> you know, and I want to challenge people into maybe considering non-doing, maybe consider being instead of doing. You know, and that's a very subtle practice, but how do we just be ourselves? How do we just be compassionate? How do we just be loving and gracious, you know? Um, especially when I don't know what to say. How can I just be and hold space for everything? So I wonder if I am coming to you and I'm feeling fear myself. And if you say to me to just be, don't try to do anything with it. Um, what easily could happen for me is my, there's a subtle doing I'm doing about the fear, which is avoiding it, you know, like I'm finding ways to get away from it. So when you say just be, I'll kind of, do my thing of kind of turning and getting distracted. And, you know, one of my favorite inquiries is, what are you unwilling to feel? Because yes. when, I, when I ask myself that, almost always I can start sensing, you know, some sort of a kind of an existential gripping, you know, and as soon as I become aware of it and there's the space of awareness, it no longer, there's no identification. Mm -hmm. But I can't just be until I've already in some way um, intentionally set the groundwork often if I'm, if I'm caught in something. So mm -hmm. I'm just bringing that to you to see how yeah. that lands for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I would also add to that too, that being for me also means that I am allowing the fear to be there, mm -hmm. you know, as well. Like I'm feeding, feeding the fear spaciousness you know and 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 that practice in my practice i call that loving yeah i'm loving my fear which means i'm accepting it i'm allowing it to be there and in that space that opens up then i enter into experiencing it you know because i have the space to do it you know i'm not the fear isn't consuming me but i begin to consume the fear when i offer it space to be there you know but, you know, another thing that also happens, too, when people come to me and they say, oh, Rod, I'm really afraid. And I, 
And I said, you know, me too. You know, me too. Like, I, I want you to know that I'm there in that space as well. You know, being a Dharma teacher doesn't mean that like I'm this like superhuman, completely like realized enlightened being that doesn't experience fear. It means that I actually do experience fear, but I allow it to be there, you know, in my experience. And that's what it means for me to be human, you know, is to experience, is to, to hold the space for, for the old material in my mind. And that's another thing that we begin to communicate is that presence of being with in a way in which we're just like, yeah, there you are. You know, there's the uncertainty, there's the fear, you know. And if I hold my space like this, then I can anchor other people in holding the space for their fear as well. I love the way in your language, Lamarad, that you use the word space. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's one of the, it's one of your Dharma gifts because I know for me, and when you said, I feed space to the fear, um, I have a, a practice with fear where, where I'll kind of sense the interior space that it's coming out of, just the way and all the particles of an atom will come out of emptiness. And I also sense the space that's all around it. And I sense that interior and the space around it as continuous space that's just innately tender. And then the fear's there, but it's floating and there's no identification. And space is such a powerful way to loosen that identification. It's so beautiful. Absolutely. It was a beautiful practice too. Uh, um, you know, another really important part of how I work with fear is actually by remembering my ancestors. Mm. You know, as someone who is descended from Africans and African enslaved folks and indigenous folks, you know, in the South, um, I, as I'm, as I deeply connect to my ancestors, they gift to me this kind of fearlessness and letting me know that I'm actually not alone in facing mm. the fear that comes up for me, that they've faced fear, you know, in their life and that they, in a way, hold the space in back of me. They like to kind of form this wall, you know, and then when I feel blown over by fear, they catch me mm -hmm. and say, you know, you're not alone. Um, and to feel that unconditional, mm -hmm. direct support um, from these beings, um, I think is a resource that I really encourage so many of us to to do the work to connect to you know as well for me i believe that um our ancestors you know are holding tight right now they're holding tight and i know many of us in very different places with this some of us this is not you know anywhere in our practice or in our belief system but just for those of us that are called into relationship with our elders, I encourage them just to rely on the, 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 our ancestors, you know, um, as a support for our fear, you know. Um, I just, you know, I, I just, I, I'm at this point in my practice where my fear is on one hand, really uncomfortable, and I'd rather not deal with it. But on the other hand, my fear is so precious to me. There's a preciousness to it, you know, because in certain ways, my fear, in many, in complete ways, actually, my fear is teaching me something, you know, and I'm so, there's a part of me that's always desperate to be taught mm. by everything, mm. you know, there's so much a part of Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, or Tantric Buddhism, where like the phenomenal world, including the material of our minds, everything is teaching us. You know, even in suffering, it's teaching us. Even in terror, even the trauma is teaching us. You know, and I try not to waste that precious opportunity to be taught. I love that. It's so beautiful to perceive 
fear. I think of the, the Tibetan art where mm -hmm. all the fearsome deities and the idea is to get to sacred space, it's going through them. It's not like you try to get rid of them and then get there. It's the actual engagement with fear, which is really nature's protector. It's yes. just part of our yes. organism yeah. that helps us to realize that that's not our identity. It's not yeah. the bound, there's a formless presence beyond that. Um, so what I, I keep doing, Rod, in my own practice is when fear comes up is in some way I'm reminding myself that this belongs. And, I, and I'll actually whisper that sometimes, this belongs. And then um, it goes beyond that, beyond this belongs to this knowing that the only way to love is to actually that practice that dying that goes with letting fear be. It's, it's really just a dying of separate selfness. <laughs> but fear is the pathway to love. I mean, it's why you link those in my mind is because it, it's, it's the way. And for me, it's every single day. I mean, there's not a day that I don't feel some clenching that I have to lean into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and you know, and, 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 you know, and the fear, you know, for some of us, the fear is just still so completely overwhelming. So completely, it just completely shuts us down. And in those cases, when I am helpless, I just fall to the earth and let the earth catch me. Mm -hmm. And I give, I imagine just giving the fear to the earth, you know just offering the fear. This is why in the practice we did this, you know, just moving through earth, moving through gratitude and so forth, because we have to, as we move through this period, we have to allow sources of refuge to emerge within our practice and get really creative, you know, and understand this, the earth is right under us, it's always under us, it's always holding us, it's always loving us. You know, why can't we let the earth take care of us? Yeah. Why can't we offer to the earth the things that we can't hold for ourselves? And when I find myself falling, how can I just say, ask the earth to catch me? Mm. Just to catch me. You know, or ask my com uh, compassion or, or gratitude to catch me or ask my communities to catch me, ask my loved ones to catch mm -hmm. me, ask Tara to catch me or ask my breath to catch me or ask the spaciousness to catch me or ask the ancestors um, to catch me. You know, one of the things that I'm saying over and over again to folks is that we have to ask for help. Mm. And I tell people to literally say that out loud. You know, whenever they feel overwhelmed, I say, please help me. Whatever there is around me as a source of refuge, please help me. And allow those sources of refuge to emerge because often we can't get the help we need until we call into the space for that help. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we have to imagine it. Yeah. It, I feel like so much of this path is imagination. Mm -hmm. And it's because if we can imagine it, it's already there mm -hmm. and we bring it into its fruition. And I, and I love that you talked about um, the goddess Tara, because uh, it's such a, a deep part of my practice too, to call upon and invoke and surrender into and have hold me. And what I've noticed is that I have to keep repeating it and repeating it. And I, I sometimes do it many, many times. In some way, I'm bowing and saying, just take this life, yes. you know, take this body, take this fear. But the more I do it, the more it actually becomes a um, spontaneous um, surrendering. Yes. And uh, it's like whatever you practice gets stronger. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole invitation to keep being imaginative and experimenting that's so powerful on this path. So much, so much of that imagination and creativity is, is what has helped me survive in this body, in this world. You know, it's something that's offered through my ancestry, is the innovation, the creativity, is the transformation 
of rigidity into fluidity. You know, we speak about Tara, you know, whom I call the mother, you know, in the same way that you do Tara, it's, it's I offer everything that I struggle with to the feet of the mother. Yeah. You know, I make an offering, you know, just please take this, like, yeah. please, please take this, this anger, this sadness, this fear, I, please take this, you know, and in that practice, that's really, that begins to remind us of the space. Yes. You know, over and over again, because without space, it's hard for us to get creative and innovative. It's hard for us to give rise to wisdom and clarity if we're being swallowed by the suffering itself. And when it's consuming us, there's no liberation. But when we begin to offer yeah. to the feet of the mother, we begin to consume the chaos. Uh -huh. you know? Just to share with you, uh, Marad, since this is immediate, when I was uh, leading up to our conversation today, um, I, I hit a major fatigue and then I, and, and a sense of, oh, what's this going to be like? And then the kind of more small minded stuff of, oh, am I going to, you know, will I be able to show up in a way that's real? And, you know, and then the whole white cisgender woman making, you know, not doing it well, you know, that whole, so I, the practice that came to mind said, okay, this is all about fear. So here we are. You know? mm -hmm. So I brought you to mind and I just uh, mentally whispered, we are friends. And as you said, we hadn't met, but I just mm -hmm. said it. And the assumption of it brought the truth of it it, the potential and what's possible because we both have hearts that want to be awake and connect into a more immediacy and all that anxiety dissolved it's like not, nothing goes wrong if you trust your belonging mm -hmm. so i just mm -hmm. wanted to share that with you because it had a, such a sweet feeling and then when you did the gratitude practice i was feeling my gratitude for you and it deepened so i wanted to name it out loud yeah I appreciate that. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, it's, you know, I have come a really long way. Now, I couldn't, obviously, I couldn't have this conversation in my 20s <laughs> because <laughs> it would have been a different conversation. Um, but I, you know, I came into Dharma just actually just trusting you know, a lot of stuff, you know, because it, in one way the Dharma felt really um, familiar. Like it felt like, oh, this is like, I know this. But then on the other hand, I was like, ah, I just don't know about this love and this compassion. And like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that, <laughs> you know? But really, you know, for me, my early practice was learning how to be with myself, mm -hmm. you know, and to trust myself, you know, and that actually over the years has helped me to enter into relationships and dialogues like this, where it's always remembering that, yeah, we're all trying to do our best. You know, we're all trying to do our best. We just don't get it right sometimes, you know, um, and I want to trust that. You know, that's one of the things I hold on to is that assumption that even if you're doing something to hurt me, I just want to, part of me still wants to believe that you're, there's some part of you who's trying and it's, it's not maybe working, <laughs> you know, but you're trying right now. And I resonate with that really strongly, you know, as well, you know, um, but we, you know, a lot of us don't have spaces to open our hearts up in, you know, we don't have relationships and spaces and, you know, where we can just be vulnerable to practice the vulnerability, you know, um, and the openness. And I, I worry about that. Well, you know. so many people got completely um, violated and wounded so yeah. early that it's not safe to. Yeah. And what you just said really struck me about that you're, no matter how another person's behaving, no matter how I'm treating you, something in you wants to trust that 
you know, I'm trying my best or there's some goodness in there. And it's kind of, it's very similar to your compassion practice in that you're, you're, if you're dedicated to seeing my goodness, it helps to bring it out in me. So that even if I'm misbehaving, if you are steadfast and saying there's goodness in there somehow, it's going to bring it out. So I, I just, that seems like the companion practice to yeah. holding the space of compassion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and also a part of that compassion practice too is about boundaries, you know, and it's about articulating, you know, what's coming up for us, you know, you know, what's coming up in, in any interaction with anyone, right? That's, you know, just to say, oh, you know, this thing was said, this is how it's landing for me and having the courage to move into that, you know, because I think there's a level of, as you're, you know, as you, as you rightfully pointed out, there's like a woundedness mm -hmm. around trusting, you know, because of the ways in which we've been deeply hurt. And for me, I've had to retrain myself mm -hmm. to trust, but I, it's, it's not been so much, again, trusting other people, but trusting myself yeah. to yeah. hold other people. And to, as I hold other people, also holding myself and tending to myself. You know, as one of my teachers would always say, and this is a quote that I use in the book, you have to drink as you pour, mm -hmm. you know? So I trust myself that as I'm pouring and being open and vulnerable in whatever interaction I'm moving through, I'm actually offering back to myself. So I don't forget that I always have needs that have to be met. If those needs are not met, then I begin to shut down. I begin to succumb to the fear. Um, I begin to react to the fear and maybe use something really harmful and hurtful for myself or for the person that I'm with. Right, and that's where, and you describe it powerfully in your book, which is that when we haven't tended to the fear, or if we hadn't tended to the brokenheartedness, then it comes out in violence. It comes out in violence and part, again, sometimes I see and hear that violence as asking for help. You know, when, when people, or I'll just use myself as an example, when I've done really harmful things, in the past has actually come out of the ways in which I was not holding space for myself. I was not tending to my own brokenheartedness and sadness, and I just reacted to it, and then that created harm, you know? And what I was really trying to say instead of creating harm was that I just really need help. Mm. Like, I'm just really sad. I'm just really isolated. I'm really lonely, you know? And I have no, agency in this and so I'm propelled into this kind of compulsory relationship with this really tough material that comes up for me so I'm just reacting over and over and over again you know and what the world needs are practitioners who are able to see that to see that violence the expression from others as them asking for help but to do that seeing in a way in which we're also taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're also setting boundaries. We're also not just walking into be the, being the recipients of violence, you know, because that's not compassion either, you know, you know, but to say, you know, I see you, I hear you, but you don't get to do that, right? You know, and I have to reflect back to you the ways in which you're creating harm because you're not able to be with the hurt, you know? And maybe that's my activity is to feed that back to that person. So a lot of what you're describing is how you work with students. And I'm wondering if how involved you are in peer group, collective activities that, um, in some way together, here we are together working with the fears that are here. Here we are together working with the heartbreak. Are you involved with that? Yeah, like any, you know, I have all kinds of sessions and groups that I work, work with people online through, you know, I work with my own Sangha, you know, Bumi Sparsha around these very same practices um, and issues. 
um, for many years, um, I, you know, after something, some, some act of violence in the world, a killing of unarmed, some, you know, an unarmed black person in the world, I would gather people mm. in healing circles and hold space, you know, um, as this, as this way to offer healing and restoration, you know, as well. Um, you know, I have to, I have to live the Dharma. That's the only way that I survive. You know, that's the only way for me in a black queer body, that's the only way I've been able to survive is to actually do this. And I've not, you know, for those of us who are occupying these, these, these intersections of a lot of marginalization, you know, be it, you know, being black, indigenous, people of color, trans, you know, um, different abilities and so forth. Like it's, it's really for those practitioners coming into the space where it's like, ah, you know, I actually have to really do this because actually my life and mental health are really at stake. Like this isn't like something that I do on the weekend just to have fun because this is what, you know, cool people do. No, this is like actually saving my life because this is the only way I'm surviving. You know, these systems of violence, you know, that are imposed on me, have been imposed on me from the very moment you know, I came into this realm, you know, this reality. Um, so my dharma often, I call it a dharma of struggle. Mm. You know, it's a dharma that like I've really had to, you know, test and, you know, and, and really um, work out over and over again and wear out, <laughs> you know, and I've earned that dharma. So like for me, it's like, I don't think in theories, I just think from actual life experience, you know, and where our lives actually become the sutras, mm. you know, our life is, is actually sacred text, you know, that begins to teach, you know, ourselves and others. You know, this is why I think that the realm of the personal is such a profound tool of transformation and teaching for me. And this is why I write in the way that I write. This is why I teach in the way that I teach, because you have to know that this isn't me performing, you know, to get you to buy into a version of me. This just is me and how I've had to consume the Dharma, you know, and in other ways and how the Dharma is consuming me. So I love that because you're, what I'm hearing is that your life is an expression of the Dharma. It's how the yeah. Dharma is living through you right yeah. this moment and yeah. then this moment. And I'm curious if there's anything shifting or notable mm -hmm. about how the Dharma is living through you right in this particular mm -hmm. week or month mm -hmm. or two months? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I find that the Dharma is really taking me into the contradictions. Mm -hmm and helping me to make a home in contradictions you know and i think in our community we have a tendency to actually oversimplify the things you know and i think oversimplification does not line up with our relationship to justice you know and particularly when we talk about peace and how this idea of peace can be weaponized from Buddhists to suppress and silence those of us who actually do not have the privilege not to struggle, mm -hmm. you know, and not to have to fight. Like I've had to fight to be alive. I've had to physically fight to be alive, you know, um, to be able to sit here. And I want to honor that in my practice because I, I want to, 
to recognize that like everyone's coming from very different places, you know, in the world, you know, and in and, and very different places and practice and very different identity locations. And so I find that the Dharma is really just like throwing me into this space right now. And it's really beginning to generate, you know, the foundation for the next book, <laughs> you know, um, that I'm beginning to work on. Um, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. That's what it really is. It's, it's no longer about black and white. It's about this grayness where you're like, ah, I actually don't know what to think or I don't know what to do, but the only thing that I can do is just show up. So can you give an example of that when you talk about contradiction yeah. and and the reason I'm asking that is because you said something um, somewhere else, and I don't know where, <laughs> but it's okay. That that really got me thinking, and it was about about nonviolence. Oh yeah. And yeah. I thought that like that you know anything that shines a light on the uh, any notion that we have of things should be a certain way mm -hmm. that the highest thing is nonviolence. So, so I'm curious if you'll just speak a little more for you at. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think, I, I think I know exactly what you're referring to, which was a panel that I did a couple of weeks ago, um, where on that panel, I was supposed to be the peaceful pacifist Buddhist. Um, that actually wasn't the case. <laughs> and so everyone was really confused on that panel. But for me, I recognize the presence of skillful violence, you know, and that means that if I see someone that I love in danger, I'm just actually not going to stand there and pray that they're okay. You know, I think about a parent and a child, right? I don't know. My, I am 40 years old. My mother would still jump into a fight if someone tried, <laughs> you know, um, to attack me. Um, even though I'm bigger than her, like she would still jump in. And this is what I mean. It's like, what are times that drive us into violence to protect or to dismantle, disarm, or to um, decrease, you know, further harm from happening, you know? And is that skillful violence? And, 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 and trying to practice a skillful violence, that's really not, that's not about getting back at someone. It's not about trying to hurt others as much as they've hurt us, but it's about de-escalating because that is the only language that we can use in that moment to de-escalate, you know, harm in that moment. Um, is that different than Arjun on the battlefield? You know, where there's basically, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and kill because if I kill here, that could save a whole lot of lives there, but I'm going to do it without any hatred. I'm just mm -hmm. going to do it because it seems like the wisest thing to do. Arjuna, or even the Buddha in past lives did the same thing. These archetypal stories of like, well, if I see more, am I ethically responsible to do something in the moment? Mm -hmm. You know, and am I trusted enough to do this in the moment? You know, um, I think that's a really important thing. And that's, those are the ethical questions, the ethical contradictions that I'm really okay. interested in, you know, but yes, like, I think that like, yeah, will this reduce violence? This, will this reduce greater harm in the future? And I think that there is something there for us to consider, you know, absolutely. Um, I just don't, samsara, the cyclical existence is much more complex than I was led to believe in my early Dharma practice. So I'm maturing into this complexity, you know, I'm in maturing into ethics, you know, I'm maturing into how actually enlightenment doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, it's like, I have to let go, but I have to be in the world. Like, what, you know, what is that all about, you know? Um, and I have to sit with that. I have to sit with that and slowly metabolize, well, to, yeah, to, to metabolize it, to really just break it down and work with it and discern and talk about it and think about it and study and have discussions, you know, it's really uncomfortable. So I want everything to be really clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's really don't know mind, the human, yeah. the really being humble because yeah. the right wrong thing is so nice when it's sharp and distinct, but it isn't. Yeah. yeah.
So we just really have to trust our practice and we have to sit with discomfort. Well, and I think the body is the, I mean, the body is intelligent and if we can keep on paying attention, (laughs) it'll guide us, but we tend to want to have in our minds the answers too quickly and we leave our bodies prematurely. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes, I think so much of my practice is about the embodiment is about just like as much as I can coming back yeah. over and over again, you know, cause I've earned my rights to this body. You know, I survive, you know, these systems, you know, violence and oppression, which have forced me in the past to think about, about my body as being unclean, mm-hmm. you know, and unfit and dirty and not good enough, you know? And so I've survived that. And I just really celebrate the work that I've been able to do to love my body, even though I have much more work to do, but I celebrate the work that I've been able to do, you know, because that celebration becomes a way in which we begin or continue to disrupt these systems. They're feeding us these messages over and over and over again. And that is such a powerful form of activism for us, you know, like that, just owning what I've been told not to own, celebrating what I've been told not to celebrate, right? Being proud of who I am, you know, in a culture that tells me to to shut up and to be silent, to be invisible, right? You know, to live within an administration right now that every day attempts to erase so many of us and to still be out and proud and visible and loving and joyful. You know, that's part of how we wage political warfare. You know, in the words of Mother Audre Lloyd, right? Like my self-preservation is political warfare. I love it and I love your words, reclaim. I mean, just reclaim this body and I understand that as a black man, it's it's a whole other dimension of reclaiming, and um, and I'm aware that um, we're almost out of time. And I would love you to, um, because you're riding us into the sunset here, <laughs> you know, to um, close us with something in whatever spirit really is calling you right now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so I, you know, I just want to kind of end the session just by dedicating the merit, actually, you know, and I just want to, on behalf of all of us who've gathered in the space, I dedicate the merit, the positive energy, the virtue, you know, that we've generated. I dedicate it on behalf of all of us, the liberation of all beings, that all beings may be freed through the profound revolutionary practice of compassion love, generosity, um, that all beings find a practice that helps to liberate them, that all beings find a home that takes care of them, and that we, those of us here, become agents of healing, restoration, liberation, not just for our communities, but for ourselves as well. And may we all just be free as quickly as possible. Thank you, my friend. Really, really appreciate you being with us. And thank you to all who are joining us. Uh, Wishing everyone many blessings.